What's up, everybody? I'm Scott. And I'm Jason. And you are listening to Liquid Carnage, my friend. We have made it to month three of 2022. I know. I know. The, it's 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 rolling. It's rolling. I, I would say it's the two-year mark of, of the COVID pandemic, but it appears that we have abruptly ended the pandemic uh, to watch the beginnings of, of World War III over in Eastern Europe. It was so funny. I had some friends that called me this weekend and they were talking about uh, planning a trip to, to Europe uh, this this summer. Um, and I said, oh, so you're thinking about maybe going to Kiev, Kiev or whatever? Yep. You're thinking about going to Kiev or you think thinking about going to Ukraine for, for summer vacation? And we started chuckling because, you know, obviously it's now the start of war. But um, but uh, yeah, so, yeah, boy, that came on all of a sudden, too. I mean, I, I don't know if it came on all of a sudden. I'm sure if you ask the intelligence groups of the United States, they knew this was at some point it was going to happen. It was going to happen. Yeah, it's, um, it, it's been interesting to to watch this because I think I think we we could all see this coming. I I, I think um, Russia definitely overestimated their abilities, and I think the world definitely, and especially Russia, Russia underestimated the the abilities of Ukraine and the willingness to defend their their own freedom. You know, I, I I think that's been a huge factor into this whole fiasco. Well, and and I think as this has developed. You know, as it develops, um, I think that we are finally getting into a war where there is definitely a good guy and a bad guy. Yeah. Uh, And it's very easy to delineate that. I think the last few wars that we've had, we just haven't had that sort of delineation where you are the bad guy and we are the good guy or vice versa. You know, I mean, so... It's been uh, it's been kind of a very uh, clearly defined, at least in my opinion, a clearly defined line of who is wrong and who is right. And of course, we want to be on the side of right. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that. I, I would argue that I, I think when you talk about the Gulf War of the '90s from 30 years ago, uh, I thought I think there clearly was uh, a, a good guy versus a bad guy. I mean, when, when Hussein invaded Kuwait, I, I think that was pretty straightforward and uh, you can argue the war on terror with Al Qaeda, you know, in my opinion, it, it is probably, you know, we, there's a definite bad guy there, but you now it's to me, this is pretty straightforward too. You know, Putin said he's going to do it. We said, don't do it. And he did it. So, you know, some, something's going to happen. And I, I think they greatly underestimated the, the people of Ukraine and their, their abilities uh, to fight back and take a stand for what they believe in and their freedoms. Yeah, it sure has been an eye-opening, um, uh, an eye-opening um, discovery of what kind of person makes up a Ukrainian. Uh, yeah. boy, boy, you talk about some some tough, strong people. I you mean, know, they, 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 they sound like a little bit on the crazy side. <laughs> they just are like. No, we will push you out. So we we get sticks. We throw sticks at you. We don't care. We kill you. you yeah, know what I mean, like they don't even mess around. And, and and I guess that doesn't really surprise me, to to a big extent, because Ukraine what you, is is a former Soviet state, uh, uh, from you know what the Cold War and whatnot. So okay. that culture, you know, the, the Russian culture, uh, permeates through them too, because the, the Russians are are tough people historically. And when you're living in an area like Eastern Europe, where it's not always the most pleasant weather, uh, let's face it, the food is not uh, amazing. I mean, it's 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 very hearty. It's 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 it's. I can't imagine it being the best the best environment to grow up. So you have no choice but to be tough. You know. Yeah, I mean, you know, I I look at this whole thing, and it developed pretty in the face of the American people, right? The news yeah. is talking about it a lot. And, and, and so you're listening to this unfold and um, you know, you, you, you definitely are, were made aware of the fact that um, that Vladimir Putin and Russia has definitely um, been believing a certain narrative that, but they've been believing a narrative and they're acting upon that belief. Um, and you, you were seeing what that means, you know? Yeah. The, it, you know, it, the, the nice thing is you talk about that belief. There's um, 
a lot of stories out there how you know Putin was putting the all these these stories out there to to get the Russian people to understand why he's invading, and uh, the nice thing is is the rest of the world that's been able to that has, has the counterintelligence and I, I read the U.S. is doing this is like they have the counterintelligence they're just like releasing and saying no that's not the case this is really what's happening this is X Y and Z not not A B and C so it's you know helping to diffuse a lot of this you know situations to a lot of the rate of the Russians that that are unsure about the warfare you know yeah I mean it, it's interesting because you know one of Putin's big um, arguments was that that there were a lot of people in Ukraine who wanted to be Russian and were un- Putin was or the Putin government was thinking that um, that Ukraine was a bunch of neo-nazis who were doing genocide against Russian people who wanted to be Russian so that's why that's what he told people is we're doing this to protect Russian citizens. Um, and I think when you base your premise on of action on a lie or a, mis- a mistruth, um, I think you're going to start seeing what the consequences of that are. Um, yeah. It, it, it's interesting to me today, especially being 2022 and with the, uh, the rise of the Internet and you can't you don't know what's real, what's not anymore. You know, and then I think we've proven that in American media is there's so much fake news, false news, unverified news, um, pur- you know, purposely you know, strained or, or angled news to, to, to show your political views. It's hard to get a real idea of what's actually going on, you know, and I don't know if you remember this movie. There's an old Robert De Niro, Dustin Hoffman movie from the 90s called Wag the Dog. Yes, yes. Do you remember White the Dog? For the for our yes, uh-huh. out there, White, White the Dog. It's an interesting uh, movie that actually I think takes place in Eastern Europe, or they they, they set it up to take place in Eastern Europe. Yeah. But if I remember right, the bottom line is uh, th- those men have to create a fake war for the American media, and they pick Eastern Europe um, to get whatever they need done for the government. You know, so they were able to recreate, at least make the the American people think there's this massive war going on, when in all reality it was not nearly as bad as as they wanted to portray. And I'm not saying that this is not that that, that this is on a, a lot less severe level, but to me it's just very interesting how it's being portrayed in the American media. You know, what have you thought about? What have your thoughts been about the response from the United States um, uh, to all of this? You know, I'm I, I'm okay, I'm okay with it because uh, the the general thought from everything I've read is that listen, this is an this is a European uh, situation, so it's better for us to follow the lead of our European allies than to step up and say this is the case. And you know, you, you figure we're we're very strong with 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 Germany and the United Kingdom and and France and whatnot, and if they're going to make those sanctions, it's better for us to fall in line with them and support their sanctions in my opinion and, and build off of that instead of leading the way uh since this is definitely turning into a, a european union issue as of today i think ukraine signed the application to join the european union so um <clears throat> you know this seems like a conflict that we should just be able to support and not have to stick our nose in first yeah yeah i i kind of agree with you i mean i i have no problem with the sanctions um, I do kind of agree with some of the the congressmen and senators who said we should have done more sooner. Um, I kind of do feel that way. Uh, on the other side, anytime you're dealing with someone who has a nuclear arsenal, there is you can't just rush in and say I'm going rush in. Huh? You can't just barge in and say I'm going to just you know knock you out and and drive you you know everything throw everything at you and destroy you because you put someone's back against the wall who says I've got nothing to lose at this point. <laughs> uh, they can, they can cause a lot of damage. Um, and, you know, I, I think the important to remember when you start talking about nuclear warfare is that, that is an absolute last ditch effort. And when that happens, um, the world basically ends. I mean, the world as we know it ends because it yeah. doesn't, it, you, you're not just firing off one warhead at that point. Now allies are involved and, you know, everybody's getting hit from every direction and, you know, there are mass, mass casualties. And I, I will openly say this, that I, I firmly believe there will never be uh, a nuclear war of that level or any level um, because of 
you know, and I'll say conspiracy theories that one world governments already rule the world or aliens the, that, that work with our governments don't want us firing off those weapons again. So I, I think it's a nice threat and it's a nice threat for the people in the media to say, well, Putin's you know, threatening this, but ultimately I don't think it happens. There's too much. Uh, maybe. I mean, I, I, I don't agree with that at all. I think he's totally capable of doing it because here's a man who can justify any action on a lie. Any action he can justify a lie. He invaded a country because the neo-Nazi regime of Ukraine was damaging Russians who wanted, or you know, Ukrainians who wanted to be Russian. So he he created that narrative, and he believes that narrative. And what's to stop him from saying? Because what was one of the biggest things that his argument was is that look. You know, the West and the United States are infringing through Ukraine on our border, on our sovereignty. We have to protect our sovereignty. We don't want Russia. We don't want anything to do with them. We're not trying to, you know, invade or try to, you know, put troops on the ground near Russia. But he believes that. So what other things is he going to make himself believe? I I totally see it could be a possible reaction. I really do. I I think that he's he's. He's the type of person that when you believe something and you, you can convince yourself of something, even if it's not even true, there's no telling what you're willing or capable of doing. You know, I, I guess for me, it comes down to knowing that at the end of the day, that 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 option is such a, a nuclear option. Um, it, it's like I said, it ends the world because if they fire something like that, then someone else fires on them and then their allies fire on that person. Then the allies, of the other, other person, you know, fire. And pretty soon we have, we have warheads flying all over the world, hitting targets, trying to hit targets. And, you know, I, I'm sure America, the United States has a great defense system for that, but you just need one to, to slip through, you know, what have your what's been your thoughts about the Ukrainian response and the resistance to to Russia? Oh, I think it's great to be honest with you. I, I think uh, I, I think that they uh, have been greatly underestimated. Like I mentioned that earlier, and um, these people are are literally fighting for their freedom. So you can't blame them. I mean, if we, I mean, this is basically the Ukrainian version of Red Dawn. Yeah. yeah. And and they are doing exactly what, you know, everyone in, in America would do too. I mean, say what you want. I'm, you know, about gun control or whatever else. But you know, there's you know, 300 million people in this in this state, this country. And I I think if someone tried to invade us on that level, there's a lot of rednecks with a lot of weapons that would not be afraid to say, "Come on, try and take it." I dare you. Oh uh, yeah, no one would be dumb enough to try to uh, take over the United States. I mean. You know, and I think that's the one thing that's been kind of eye opening to me is, you know, they, they say that the 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 mass of the Russian army is probably close to 200,000 troops mm-hmm. with all the tanks and all the weapons. And, you know, so they have a, a quite a big army. The Ukrainian army, they said, was about 125 to 150,000 troops. But when you add in thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of civilians, it turns the tide who are going to also be fighting you, you can get outnumbered pretty darn quick. You know, the interesting thing I, I, I saw, and like I said, it's hard, to, it's hard to believe what you see on the media, but if you read some of the initial reports of, you know, the, the, the Russians weren't, you know, securing their um, their equipment and, and their, their service equipment, like the fuel and, and the backup ammunition and whatever else, like they, they take try to take an area and they're, the forces would move forward and, and that stuff would be the ancillary stuff would move into to set up shop. They weren't being protected. So that's where the civilians are doing the most damage was taking that stuff over and like in, you know, swift boat guerrilla warfare. And, you know, that's been a, a huge, you know, bugaboo for the Russians, you know, crippling them. Well, and I'll be interested to see how these sanctions and because, you know, over the last few days, it started with basically NATO and the United States, right? Yeah. Uh, but now it's expanding to countries that are friends with Russia, allies with Russia. And it's expanding to countries that have been neutral in most wars where they don't even get involved, like Switzerland, yeah. Finland, and Sweden. <laughs> if you, you make know, Switzerland take a side, yeah. that's, that's something. Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, they said it, that um, they said that they were going to support sanctions that the NATO and the EU were going to be doing. Well, that's I don't think Putin maybe even anticipated that either. Well, I don't think he anticipated a lot of the asymmetrical warfare. But if if I read it correctly, a few days ago, he made some overtures about coming after Finland next. Oh, really? Wow. And I think that might have that might have triggered the some of this some of this reaction, but. You know, at the end of the day, what I find most most interesting is is the asymmetrical warfare that goes on with these sanctions and and what happens with, you know, the banking and, and watching how a lot of the major American oil companies are, are, are publicly saying that they're pulling out of their, their ownership stakes of the Russian oil companies and and so forth. So it, they're they're being crippled on all sides, you know, financially. So, if you know, if that's the case, you know, whether it's smoke and mirrors or actually well, they're actually following through with it. I mean that could be devastating in, in uh, a sooner amount of time than than they probably anticipated. So, what is the response of the the Russian people who are going to be directly impacted by these financial sanctions and by the ostracism of Russia from the rest of the world? And how, you know, what is their where is it going to be their reaction to this? Because I could see it being devastating to the general population of Russia while insulating Putin and his you know group of cronies who are financially you know have the resources to protect themselves from great sanctions but the the Russian people will be feeling the effects very quickly well I, I feel like that was part of what the um, the sanctions were is freezing assets of, of a lot of the other oligarchies and and the the, the rich Russians as it is and making sure that they feel the pain as well. So I, I think by freezing those accounts and, and seizing a lot of, of their financial ability is part of the, the, uh, you know, the punch to, to get them to, to withdraw. And, and I don't know. I mean, if you ask, if you ask before the, the, the war, um, Putin had a very high popularity rate amongst the Russian citizenry. Um, you know, always looked at as a very, yeah, I think, I, I think that the, the reports, obviously you could question whether the validity of the reports is, is you mean, know, obviously, but this is a man uh, who's changed his, his election rules considerably to make sure he's reelected and his, uh, his opponents n- never get more than two or 3% of the popular vote as a coincidence. So I think though, that at some point when this kind of thing, when these kind of things happen, um, the true colors of a man or a woman start to show themselves. And I think that the world, um, you know, the people in the United States who believed that Putin was a bad person um, are now starting to uh, be uh, reinforced with other people that said, oh, I never saw it before, but yeah, this is a bad guy. This is a bad guy because, you know, the the true colors of a person do, will eventually show themselves. Um, And I, you know, I, I guess one of the things is I don't understand, I just don't understand why he's doing this, knowing that the repercussions to his country and his people um, are going to be that uh, bad. I mean, this is not good for Russia at all. I mean, the, the, the only thing I can think of, and it goes back to what you mentioned earlier, is that either he's, he's got a, an option that we're, if he were to lose it, there is a nuclear option that he doesn't care because if he's dead, he'll just he'll let things fly and the world will have to sort it out, you know, with with whatever that happens. And that could be a thing where, you know, if he's, if he has, and he's not afraid to drop those, those warheads, he might have a, a, you know, suicide switch as it were, I forget, a kill. If he dies, those things get launched. Maybe, maybe. I don't know. I I don't see an end game here. I, I, I mean, how about this? Now, I'm not sure what the end game is because the the world support from all, many countries around the world, um, there's no one that's saying, oh, Russia, good job. Well, I shouldn't say that. There's a couple people in the United States that think that he's really smart, and really savvy, and you know, he's doing a great thing. But the majority of people around the world condemn what he's doing and condemn the actions of Russia um, it, the saddest part to me is that I don't know what his end game is or what he thought was going to happen. 
I, you know, I mean, like that just tells me how out of touch you are. Who, who out there would say, man, you know, strategically, this would have been a really good idea for you to do because you're going to get nation by nation support for this action, Vladimir. Oh, okay. I'm going to do it. I just don't understand that. Yeah. I mean, that's, that is the sign of a delusional man. But then again, you know, like I said, you don't win that many elections consecutively by the percentages you do without creating your own delusion, you know? Yeah. Well, and I mean, I have to be honest, this is the kind of thing that obviously we in the United States have been dealing with for the last six years is the lie becomes truth to people. The well, a lie becomes truth, and then they are they justify their actions based on a lie that they've convinced themselves is the truth. And I, I, this is just playing out in for the world to see. If you say it enough and you believe it, then you're going to act on it. And um, the repercussions of that action, in some in this case, it might be devastating to Russia, not just now but for a long time. Oh, I think it will be des- devastating for a long time. But you know, the I mean, act- they're already saying that the ruble is basically collapsed. Yeah, well, um, you know, they're saying they they suspended the stock market in Russia for a week because they're so afraid that the companies in the stock market are going to just be destroyed. Um, and we're not even a week in. I mean, we're on we're recording this on day five, so it hasn't even played out yet. I, I think and, the, the irony of the situation is the, the, all the misinformation that they've, they've been allegedly putting into the, the American media um, is, I would say, is almost backfiring now because they don't know what to believe. So or nobody in, in the world knows what to believe from the media. So their misinformation campaigns um, have helped them probably lose any kind of popularity contest in this war, or any kind of validity of of what their you know reasoning is. I have to say, I respect the Ukrainians, man. I mean, you talk about some tough, tough people. That, I mean, they're they're fighting and they're not, you know, and they're very much, um, you know, they don't placate or they don't try to sugarcoat anything. You know, I mean, they just say, you know, fuck you, Russia. But, you know what I mean? Like, they don't even mess around with, well, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's like, screw you, get out of our country. We don't want well, you here. Well, that's, that's lit- this is literally a do or die situation for them. So you can't blame them. I can't do you think? Uh, do you think that um, at some point, what are your thoughts about whether they will be able to, to sustain this resistance? Um, I think I don't know if they will. Well, a lot depends on that. I don't know how much you know Russia is holding back, and I don't know how much Ukraine is holding back. You know, so it's the, the unfortunate part of war is there's always escalation. And it depends who blinks first and, and moves to the next level. Of, of escalation and all hell breaks loose based on that. Well, the, the one thing that, I mean, I look at the Vietnam war and although the losses on the North Vietnamese side were, were great. When you have an entire civilization who's willing to fight, that's going to be a hard thing to overcome. Yeah. It's going to be a very difficult thing to overcome because the what what Ukraine is I don't know forty or fifty million people. If you get forty or fifty million people that are willing to fight to the death to keep you out of their country, even if you overtake them, you're not going to be able to keep it. Would you say this is Russia's Vietnam then? Oh, uh, I, I I don't. I mean, how about this? In other situations, when for example. We when we went into Afghanistan, we did establish a government. We established a, a, a society, a structure, a law and order. Unfortunately, when we left, the, the 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 community that we left wasn't willing to fight as hard as we were fighting for them. Right? Yeah. Um, Russia has been in Afghanistan. They were able to establish a, a, a Russian government. That lasted like two or three years before they said, you know, we, we don't have enough money to fund this anymore. And they pulled out and then it collapsed in Afghanistan. This is going to be totally different because let's say that they do overtake Ukraine, which which in my opinion, I think it's possible that they could immediately that they could in the next few weeks have overpowered the um, the Ukrainian cities and taken them over. I don't think that he can sustain it. I don't think that he can then put in a government that will be able to protect and maintain 
uh, control of Ukraine. So as soon as as soon as they do that, what are you going to do? You're going to put all your soldiers in there because, like you said, uh, at some point it's going to be like Vietnam. Every citizen will fight you. Every citizen will revolt against you. And do you want to constantly be fighting a war that you can never really truly win? Yeah. I don't. I don't think so. But you know, it's funny you mentioned Vietnam. I watched Air America the other night. Do you okay. Air America? Yeah, I do. Huh. What a great movie. I mean, it panned in the box office. I don't oh, go, of course, yeah. You know, but a young Robert Downey Jr. and Mel Gibson back in the early 90s. Um, it's basically about American uh, America dropping supplies over in Laos to help support the Vietnam, the Vietnam War effort in the late 60s, early 70s. And, you know, it's, it's very close to probably what's happening today. Uh, you know, there's so many things going on in the background we don't know about. But help turn that tide uh for the positive if, if the right people get the right supplies so you know we'll just wait and see you know it's ultimately it's you know it, it's it's this is a, a war or whatever they're calling it right now because maybe it's not a war yet an invasion that hopefully doesn't uh escalate much further than it already is but you know and yeah i mean i i guess the one thing i will say is that um i i don't understand the end game I don't see how Russia wins, even if they take over Ukraine. What's your exit strategy? Because one, you're not going to be able to keep the country forever because it will overthrow you. I mean, you've angered, you've angered a citizenry that seem like they're more than happy, unless you're going to kill every single one of the Ukrainians. They they seem more than willing to uh, do guerrilla warfare, to do, you know, you know, resistance, for years or oh, the other and side you... the other side of it too is is the, the russian people that don't want this that aren't asking for this and they're being forced to sign up for the military or you know you know the ones that are being called in from the active reserve to active reserves from their that don't believe in this war yeah. you know how many russians walk off you know in, in that scenario well and and the other thing is is that the, the sanctions that have these financial sanctions that have been put on the Russian people. How do you get those taken away? I mean, you've incurred the wrath of the entire world. The yeah. entire world is now against you. So what, what, you know, if, if Germany no longer relies on Russia for oil and energy, or if some of these other countries just say, you know what, we'll never do business with you again, which in the short term, that's what's going to happen. Yeah, you know, it's Russia. Funny. What do you have? I mean, you have nothing. It's, it's, it's funny. A lot of these countries have gone, you know, very far with their sanctions, except to mess with the oil. No, that's not true. They 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 shut down the the Nord Two stream uh, pipeline that was supposed to be connecting Russia to Germany. Uh, Germany decided to actually do sanctions against. I mean, the, the uh, Russia's oil. I mean, they're, they're basically not buying oil from Russia. Uh, so I, I think that the sanctions are, are have gone that far. Mm. I mean, I, I think, well, but then again, that's why our oil prices are going up now, because, I mean, we've, we've, re, we've taken away a huge supplier of, of oil to the world. You know, and um, I, saw a lot of, I saw a lot of that on, on, the, on the social media. Is like, I hope everyone's happy that, you know, didn't, that didn't vote for Trump because this was coming and i'm thinking it's, you know if, if that was if if he would have won re-election we probably would have been invading ukraine with russia at this point for whatever yeah i and, i firmly believe that he would have done nothing to stop it yeah and you know the, the other side of it too when it comes to oil and gas prices you know the u.s has a, has a massive oil supply we have a massive reserve and and clearly, if we're still pumping out in the Gulf and we're the, the Dakotas and Texas and what, Oklahoma, whatever else, uh, we have plenty of oil and we can be energy efficient. We're just going by the Lil Kim method of why spend mine when I can spend yours. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. No. I, I I'll be interested to see how this unfolds. Um, I, I I do respect the Ukrainian people for what they're fighting for. Um, I have no problem, you know, and that's the worst part. I don't have anything against the russian people i have something against the russian uh government because it it, the government itself i don't see how you're doing this for the best interest of your people well and your your people are going to suffer 
I don't see, you know, if you're supposed to be there for your people, how can you say you're there for your people when this is affecting them? And for what? I mean, I, I just don't get it. So no. I, I agree. I agree. But uh, if you have some thoughts, comments, or ideas on what's going on in Eastern Europe right now, hit us up on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, all at Liquid Carnage. We'd love to hear it. If you have any Ukrainian food options up in Den- the Denver metro area for our EP Tom to try out, hit him up on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter at Liquid underscore EP. Uh, he'd love to hear from you. I'm sorry I messed that one up because Frankie is asleep next to me, and he's just lit one of his legs just – it, he just did the stanky leg laying down. Like it just went nuts. And it was his front <laughs> leg. So it's hard to explain. But... Oh man. That's funny. Uh, yeah. I'm sure the EP is going to talk to us about that though. Yeah. Like, yeah. He's got to control his bodily movements, you know? Oh yeah. Well, he, I'm sure he's going to talk to us about this one anyway. Plus he, uh, for those that didn't watch the Saturday night live this past week with John Mulaney, they did talk about uh middle-aged men and podcasts and there's a John Mulaney clip with that. So if you get a chance on YouTube, uh, check it out he sent yeah. it to us to that, that was, was pretty funny, funny but that was pretty funny yeah. we don't live stream we have like five listeners on the regular so i'm not too too worried about it yeah yeah so bill frank susan nice nice talking to you nice yeah talking to you. yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> that being said jason take us home hey uh thanks for listening everybody uh our hearts and, and minds go out to the ukrainian people i i wish you well uh, that was Scott. I am Jason. And as always, if you never know quite what to say, just have yourself some liquid carnage. <laughs>